can you see my slides? You're on, Carol, thanks. Yes. So I serve on the uh, Science Advisory Board for our Biosciences and Immunocore. It is my great pleasure to speak to you today. And I'm trying to get my... It's not allowing me to go forward. I'm not sure why. Let me just do this. Ah, okay. I don't know what I did that made it go forward, but I'll speak to you today on the topic of uveal melanoma 2020. There's a lot going on in the field of melanoma. We have now new nevus risk factors predictive of transformation into melanoma. We have a new melanoma classification thanks to the National Institute of Health, the NIH. And we also have a new melanoma treatment that's undergoing investigation by many centers in the United States soon to be available in Europe and around the world. So let's begin with nevus risk factors, predictive of transformation into melanoma. How common is choroidal nevus? Well, from the Blue Mountain Eye Study in Australia, Archives of Ophthalmology, let me just change one thing here. I'm gonna go back. It was found that choroidal nevus is found in almost 7% of the white population. We did a similar study in the United States where we looked at the CDC and Haines database and we found choroidal nevus was occurred in about 5% of the US adult population. Personally, I think it's much higher than that because that study only focused on two 45 degree photographs in the macular region. Here's a spectrum of choroidal nevi. Some are small, some are pigmented, some are non-pigmented, and some are large and even giant in configuration. So how often does nevus transform into melanoma? Well, in the real world, it's fairly uncommon, but we just published in the journal Retina 2019 an analysis of 3,800 cases of choroidal nevus that we followed on the oncology service at Wills, and we followed them for many years, looking at imaging risk factors that predicted transformation into melanoma. In this database, we found that 1% showed growth into melanoma by one year, 6% by five years, and 14% by 10 years. And the risk factors using multivariate analysis that were found to be significant included some factors that you already know about that were present in previous clinical analyses. We remember these risk factors now, the most recent risk factors, by this mnemonic, too fine, small ocular melanoma doing imaging, where it represents letters TFSOM, DIM, and these represent variables, T for thickness, F for fluid, fluid on OCT, thickness on ultrasound, S for symptoms of vision loss by the vision chart, O for orange pigment on autofluorescence, M for melanoma hollow on ultrasound, and DIM for diameter greater than five millimeters by photography. This is actually quite important because these risk factors are very significant in predicting growth, you can see thickness has a very high hazard ratio. Fluid, greater than three, and orange pigment, greater than three hazard ratio. And if a patient has any one of these risk factors, there's an 11% mean chance for growth using Kaplan-Meier analysis by five years. If a patient has any two risk factors, it's a 22% rate of growth, and kind of the cut point is if they have four or more risk factors, any four, the mean rate of growth at five years is over 50%. So nowadays, if a patient has three or four of these risk factors, we're a little more prone to intervene early rather than waiting for growth because it's a high rate of growth. So let's look at one case in point. This patient has a 6.5 millimeter flat choroidal lesion with obvious orange pigment overlying it. And if we look at our risk factors, there's five of six positive risk factors. This is 
we see that the thickness is under two millimeters, but you can see on OCT, there's subretinal fluid and we have additional shaggy photoreceptors. And on autofluorescence, we can clearly discern the orange pigment. And on ultrasound, we can see this is a hollow mass. This is a 30 year old man and his score was five risk factors positive. Looking at the five-year Kaplan-Meier growth rate, that's a 55% rate of growth and with a 26 hazard ratio. This is a patient that we would treat early rather than waiting for growth. Lauren Dalvin, who's now chief of ocular oncology at Mayo Clinic, when she did her fellowship with us, she took these six risk factors and looked at every single combination of risk factors predictive of transformation of nevus into melanoma. And she made what's called a heat map where those that are orange or red have the highest risk for transformation into melanoma. And those that are blue or green have the lowest risk for transformation. And you can see on this heat map, there are several combinations of risk factors that have up to 100% five-year rate. We think this heat map will play into the future of artificial intelligence for detection of small melanoma. And rather than saying that the nevus is high risk or low risk, maybe we'll have a score of zero to 100 based on these combinations of risk factors, based on the percent risk for growth by five years. So no more guessing or wait and watching. Let's be smart about it. Let's use risk factors to score a nevus like this high risk nevus and let's use smart science. Next topic I'd like to talk about is a new melanoma classification. Most of us are doing tumor genetics where we do a sampling with fine needle aspiration biopsy into the tumor and using DNA or RNA analysis, we find the cytogenetics or the gene expression profiling. And if we have chromosome three or eight mutated, or we have a class two RNA gene, gene expression profiling, that's classified as high risk for metastatic melanoma. Well, the team at the NIH, at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, they, the same group that looked at the human genome looked at the Cancer Genome Atlas project. And they said, we, can, we all contributed, and there were many people around the United States and the world who contributed to this project. They looked at 80 cases with a multi-platform molecular analysis, and they came up with basically four groups that were distinct in their cytogenetic profile and their prognosis. They were based on the presence or absence of disomy of chromosome three. So group one was called class A, group two, class B, group three, class C, and group four, class D, with increasing risk for metastatic disease. But they only studied 80 cases. So Dr. Vishivai Paisel, when in fellowship with us, he with Lauren Dalvin and our team, went and dug up 658 consecutive patients with uveal melanoma and we applied the Cancer Genome Atlas to our cohort to see if it really was predictive of rate of metastasis. And the answer is it is highly predictive of metastatic disease. So here are our results in 658 patients. We found A was the most common class. That's good news, most low grade. That represented 52% of our series. And that only carried a 3% risk for metastatic disease at four years. Class B with disomy 3 and 8Q gain represented 14% of our cohort, and that had a 10% risk for METs at four years. Class C was monosomy 3, 8Q gain, representing 18% of our group, and that had a 25% rate of metastasis by four years. And Class D, the highest risk, monosomy 3 and 8Q gain multiple had a 41% rate of growth by four years. And this was statistically significant. And seen in table format, you can see class A, again, disomy 3, disomy 8, low risk for METs. Class B, 
disomy 3 8q gain slightly higher risk class c when monosomy enters the picture with 8q gain higher risk and class d when you have monosomy 3 and multiple 8q gains highest risk 41 percent by four years so now in our records every patient with you every patient with uveal melanoma gets the cancer genome atlas classification it's very simple it's easy to understand, it's highly predictive, and we use this now in selecting out high-risk patients for adjuvant therapies. So last, I'd like to talk to you about melanoma treatment. I think all of us are familiar with the options in melanoma therapy, enucleation, radiation, local resection, and others. We tend to use plaque radiotherapy in Philadelphia. You can see this nine millimeter tumor had a beautiful response to plaque radiation, 98% local control. So we have a good ophthalmic response, but there are problems with plaque radiation. The problems include radiation retinopathy, papillopathy, choroidopathy, and others. We've already heard from Dr. Paul Finger, who has explained his philosophy, and we believe in what he has said. We believe that it's time for us to rethink how we can reduce these complications. So we just published in JAMA Ophthalmology, I think a really important report. We looked at visual outcome at four years following plaque radiation for uveal melanoma in which we gave prophylactic bevacizumab. I'm not saying therapeutic. I'm saying we gave prophylactic to prevent radiation retinopathy. And we found in this study, again, it was bevacizumab Q4 months for two years. We found this prophylactic bevacizumab at one year, the bevacizumab group had a mean visual acuity of 20 over 40 compared to a mean of 2060 in those who were control, didn't receive any injection. And at two years, while we were still giving prophylactic bevacizumab, the rate of vision was 2050 in the bevacizumab group versus 2100 in the control group. Then we stopped giving bevacizumab, but we still found significance at years three and four. At year three, it was 2060 versus 2200. And at year four, we're off bevacizumab. We only gave two years of prophylactic injection. And in the bevacizumab group, the mean visual acuity was 2070 versus counting fingers. So this is very important information, and we're now working with the DRCR, which is a diabetic retinopathy uh, collaborative research group, to do a prospective study on this topic. I'd like to say a few words about a new uh, therapy called ARA011 nanoparticle therapy. It's currently in phase 1b2 study. It's used for small melanoma, less than 3.5 millimeters in thickness. We have about eight centers in the United States and there'll be several centers around the world in Europe and in Australia, looking at this new melanoma therapy. Basically, this is a viral-like nanoparticle that's injected through the pars plana into the vitreous. These nanoparticles are attracted to heparin sulfate that coat melanoma cells. It's coupled with a photosensitive dye so that when we shine laser light, it causes immediate necrosis of the tumor. This was approved by the FDA in March, 2017. We treated the first two patients here at Wills. Uh, actually, both patients did well, and there are several centers around the world now. We have two-year data in. Vision preservation is good. This is so unlike plaque radiotherapy or proton beam radiotherapy, where the vision starts to drop at two years. 92% of patients have vision preservation. Tumor control is fair. 65% of patients have complete tumor control. Of those that were showing evidence of growth, we have up to 90% tumor control. The main safety issue with this new nanoparticle therapy is inflammation in the anterior segment or the vit vitreous segment, but fortunately it responds to topical or injection of steroids. We're now moving forward with a new suprachoroidal delivery where we inject the medication into the choroid and we think we're gonna get better efficacy because we don't have to have the uh, medication go through the retina into the tumor. It's directly injected into the choroid and then we shine the later laser light. I think we'll see 
higher efficacy with this new supracoroidal delivery. And trials will be starting soon. Last, I'm just going to cover two important medications that we're using for systemic therapy, uh, sunitinib and immunocore. Beginning with sunitinib, this was published in Ophthalmology 2017. Patients who have uveal melanoma and their genetic profile is high risk can benefit from sunitinib. On this graph, the red line represents those who receive sunitinib, the blue line received no treatment. And you can see survival was higher, significantly higher in those who received sunitinib for the prevention of metastatic melanoma. And there was a greater significant benefit in younger patients. Others have studied adjuvant dendritic vaccination in the Netherlands, showing that high-risk patients can respond to vaccination to prevent metastatic disease. And immunocore is currently our secret weapon for treatment of metastatic melanoma, and we hope to be using it soon for the prevention of metastatic melanoma. This is one of those fancy immune modulated T cells against cancer, where we actually can find T cells and drag them into the melanoma to fight the melanoma using cell surface markers. We re-educate the T cells. So basically this is a bispecific molecule to find melanoma and T cells. The HLA-A2 receptor binds to the melanoma. Right now, currently the melanoma metastasis. And then the CD3 receptor draws in the T cell. So it brings the T cell right to the melanoma. It sounds unreal. It sounds, how can this work? But here's an example of a real live patient. We've now treated over 50 patients with this medication. We usually reserve it for patients with diffuse metastatic disease. She had over 30 metastases in her liver. You can see her liver here with all those bright spots representing metastatic disease. Just a few months after we gave her that medication, Immunocore, she showed complete resolution of all METs, and she's now greater than three years follow-up with no metastatic disease, all gone. She has to receive this medication every week. It's an infusion every week. That's no good, but at least we have a medication that might be strongly beneficial for patients with metastatic disease. Lots of work to do regarding that medication. Finally, we have pharmaceutical companies that are exploring targeted therapies for treatment and prevention of uveal melanoma metastasis. Now that we sort of understand the pathway to melanoma development. So in the past few minutes, we've discovered, we've discussed nevus risk factors. Remember the new mnemonic, using your imaging to find small ocular melanoma doing imaging. Use your ultrasound, use your OCT to find fluid, use your autofluorescence to find orange pigment. We've also discussed the new melanoma classification, the Cancer Genome Atlas classification. It's simple. Genetics are very difficult and challenging, but this simplifies our understanding of prognosis. And then last, a new melanoma treatment that's currently on the horizon, R011 nanoparticle therapy. This is best for small melanoma, and we hope to improve its efficacy by delivery of the medication directly into the choroid to the tumor. Thank you, and that summarizes uveal melanoma 2020.